Hi, my name is Ryan Pack. And I'm Nicole Barlow. And this is Soundtrack Your Life, where we speak with a guest about a soundtrack that is important to them. Today our guest is Dan Schinder, founder and executive producer of Drum Talk TV. Welcome, Dan. Thank you, and uh, I really appreciate you having me, and I'll thank you in advance for putting up with me. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> And I have to say, I'm no longer the executive producer. I just realized when I heard that my son, Stephen, who's been working with us for probably the last six and a half, seven years, has two positions, but he asked that we just give him one title. This happened recently. And he's been um, our chief content officer. He manages all the publishing of all our content across all of our social channels. He also reviews all the video submissions that come in. But he also produces everything behind the scenes as far as our live stream interviews, uh, what we do at events uh, from the streaming standpoint. We have four original series that he produces behind the scenes, and he produces everything that goes on in our membership that's live. And so he's now the executive producer, and I'm just the Jump Talk TV guy, I guess. <laughs> well, I guess you're still the founder. You can't take that away from you. <laughs> right. And that's okay. That's okay. He's... Also, the youngest of our blended family of 11 kids. He's eight years old, but he does a great job. <laughs> no, not really. He's, he's going to be 30 pretty soon. By the time I, I almost believed out, you. I know. Well, that's a pretty savvy eight-year-old. It's not out of the realm of possibility. <laughs> you never know. I've seen some musicians that they have had to have been dropped off by a flying saucer, right? There's no way they had time to learn it from YouTube, like some people are saying and stuff. It's like, what are these kids eating? I want some of that. It's amazing. <laughs> so you never know. But yeah, Steve's our executive producer, does an awesome job. Super proud of him. So Steve does a lot for Drum Talk TV, but why don't you tell our listeners uh, kind of what Drum Talk TV is? So Drum Talk TV is, uh, I founded it January 6th of 2013. And uh, in uh, last year, in 2023, in May, we had a huge celebration in Las Vegas at a theater called Notoriety. And uh, the bass icon, Jeff Berlin, was my co-host. And he kind of interviewed me about Drum Talk TV, unpacked that story, that Drum, Talk, that Drum Talk TV, that documentary comes out probably within two to three weeks, actually. It's done. We've just been all rolling around on the floor arguing, or I mean, discussing how to put it out. But some segments will hit publicly soon. And then the rest of it will be available in our membership site, which I'll get to in a moment. But we are the largest online media company that covers the world of drumming. And it's not just for drummers. It's for all music fans. Um, our peers in the industry who we've worked with all of them, we're all friends. They cover the big rock stars, pop stars, jazz stars and top educators and a few new people. We do all of that as well, but we also cover hand drumming from Morocco and North Africa, the Middle East, all kinds of drumming from West Africa, South Africa. We did two documentaries in Japan on taiko drumming, covered three festivals in Singapore. We really, really are the global heartbeat of the drumming community because we're, we have no boundaries when it comes to what we'll cover. And we'll even do interviews with people who don't have an album might not even have a huge following, but they just have a great story. They're really good musicians and have a really good story. And that's really what matters to me as far as the ethos of what we put out. And for the last three years-ish, we've been going through the brain-crushing process of developing a membership site. And we finally, I believe we have it down and we're just now literally launching it. We've been soft launching it for a couple months. And in that membership site, we have live streamed concerts in virtual environments, augmented reality. You can access on a smartphone, a tablet, a laptop or PC. You don't need special goggles or anything. And also uh, fan Q and A's with artists and not just drummers. In fact, we have Rudy Sarzo coming up from Quiet Riot, Ozzy Osbourne and White Snake fame. We have Nigel Glockler, the drummer for Saxon coming up. Um, Brad Gillis will be joining us from also Ozzy and from Night Ranger. Uh, some alumni from Yes and ELP and a, a lot of different types of musicians. And then we also have music themed game shows where we give away prizes. And once a year, we'll do an annual championship in person in Las Vegas. 
And then lastly, we have something no one else has. Not that they have all that, but where musicians, and I think drummers do this more than other musicians, they like to play the music of their favorite music, like actual published CDs and whatnot by their favorite artists, but it gets muted or pulled on pretty much uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, survives a little bit longer on TikTok. Our membership site is uh, built so that there's no algorithm to do that. It's not behind a paywall, so we don't have to pay royalties. Um, it's part of our free layer of the membership. So we're excited about that because it's a safe place to be able to do that legally without them or us getting in trouble. So those are the four big pillars of the, um, the membership site. And it's been quite an adventure, it really has. We reach 100 million people a year, and we have uh, over 1.3 million fans online. 1.3 of those on Facebook alone, and then we're on Instagram, YouTube, Vimeo, and X, or whatever that guy's calling it this month. <laughs> it's still Twitter to us. What's that? It's still Twitter to us. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't not call it Twitter, you know. Right. Because it's like, well, what do you call a post? Everyone still calls it a tweet. Yeah. Right, right. Exactly. Next. And, and if I may, I have an offer for your listeners. And what it is, is if they go to drumtalktvbrilliance.com, that's the membership site. And if they put in DTTV, the number three, and then F-R-E-E, -E, they get three months free to try it out and just see what's there and see if they like it. Oh, very awesome. And we'll put that in our show notes as well. Great. So Thanks. You can go to it's our show notes fun. and you'll find that as well. Yeah, I mean, I think the site is great. Um, obviously, you've interviewed a lot of amazing drummers, big name and small name. I also like that you uh, you interviewed um, doctors about, you know, drumming injuries. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's really cool. Like, it is really like a resource for the whole drumming community, yeah. wherever you really are. Comprehensive. Like, you, wherever you are in that journey, you have something to serve up for that person. So, that's it's Thank really you. cool. Thanks. I'm really proud of that show. Um, we call it Drumming Injury Talk, but it's really the main focus of that is repetitive motion injuries, which could affect piano players, saxophone players, guitar players, etc. So there is kind of something there for everybody. And sometimes we'll have a very focused subject. Sometimes we'll just kind of hit all the buttons, tendonitis, arthritis, carpal tunnel, and then we'll say, ask questions and we'll answer them. Well, I'll facilitate the questions to Janice, who is a physical therapist to the music industry, and she will answer them. I won't answer anything. <laughs> so a lot of fun, though. Thanks for acknowledging that. I appreciate it. Well, I feel like drummers meeting um, unfortunate fates is sort of a good segue to what we're going to talk about today. Yeah. Yeah. Spinal tap. Ugh which is modeled after other real occurrences. I've experienced some personally, but here's a fun fact. I don't know if my lovely, amazing superhero assistant McKenna told you this, but did you know that my name is in the movie Spinal Tap? Oh, do tell. Okay, so in night from 1982 to about 1985 or so, I was in a band in LA called Opus One. And we were a progressive rock band around at the wrong time. We were pushing our music, which was a cross between Gentle Giant, Frank Zappa, Super Tramp, and Old Genesis, while everything was either spandex and hairspray metal or skinny tie new wave. And we're trying to do this prog stuff in America. And um, we used to play all up and down the Sunset Strip, uh, the Whiskey, the Roxy, Madame Wong's, the Troubadour, where my parents used to date back in the early 60s wow. when I was born. Yeah, wow. And um, we used to see Rob Reiner and um, uh, Michael McKeon sometimes at our gigs. Lo and behold, the movie Spinal Tap comes up, comes out, and people used to come up to me and say, hey, like, you're not going to explode or anything, are you? <laughs> and I've, like, never been a big fat guy, so I didn't know what they were talking about. I'm like, what? The movie Spinal Tap? Have you seen Spinal Tap? I'm like, no. So I watched the movie and about one hour, seven minutes and 22 seconds, right around there. It's in the scene where Nigel has left the band and they're being, Rob's interviewing them outside. And Michael McKeon's character is saying, I don't think I'll miss Nigel anymore then. And he rattles off some past members and little Danny Schinder is a drummer who blew up. So there you go. I'm in the movie. 
<laughs> oh, that's too awesome. Good. That's too good. Yeah, we're working on getting Rob on to talk about the new Ooh. Spinal Tap movie. And wow. I don't know if he'll even make that connection or remember. So I can't wait to spring that on right. him. Right, because uh, and, yeah, they're watching making all a in sequel, the family in the right? house was What's that? Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, that's, well, that's okay. I'm sorry. We're, so they're making a sequel to Spinal Tap. I know we're a little yeah. ahead of ourselves. We haven't even talked about Spinal Tap, the original, but. Right. <laughs> yeah, they are working on that. So we're, we're going to try to get him on. But yeah, great, interesting movie. I'm not sure it's a mockumentary. I think it's, I think it's real. I think <sighs> the characters in the movie are actually portraying fake actors is what I think. <laughs> Like, is there really a Christopher Guest and a Michael McKeon? I think they're the, I don't know, it's confusing. Well, this is an interesting, I think, point of debate for Spinal Tap, right? Um, and obviously, if you haven't caught on, we're talking about the 1984 Rob Reiner movie, Spinal Tap, which is commonly considered a mockumentary, but also gets talked about in, I think, music circles as being something that is so close to reality that it's almost painful. There are quotes from musicians like The Edge from U2 where he said, I didn't laugh, I wept. <laughs> Steven Tyler has said, I did not find any humor in this at all. And 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 this, obviously, like this is to the delight of the people that made the film. Harry Shearer has said, like, well, that's worth, like, all the Oscars in the world is that musicians like find it painful. Yeah. <laughs> that means the parody like worked almost too well. So it's interesting that you say that. Why do you feel like maybe it's more, less a mockumentary and more just a legit oh, band almost? Uh, yeah. I, it, the relationship part is just like being in a real band. You've got the different personalities. If you look at Led Zeppelin, you know, John Paul Jones, of course, the quiet one, more, more debonair of them. Jimmy and Robert were up front. They also spent more time together outside the band, but Robert and Bonzo spent the most time because they knew each other since they were 15. But they all had a totally different persona. And if you look at Spinal Tap, same thing. If you look at the things that happened to them behind the scenes, the manager thing, the mix up in the size of the uh, Stonehenge props. And I saw Stonehenge in a Black Sabbath concert back when right, sure. Ronnie James Dio was with them. So, so much of those myths, the whole girlfriend thing, I was, I could not help but turn to my wife and say, that shit really happens. Back then. <laughs> that like happened to us. Okay. So there's the blankety blank girlfriend. Okay. I know where this is going. Cause we've all been there. Like no offense to girlfriends of other musicians, but we've all been there. And what impressed me about the movie, a slight sidestep is I told my wife, I was just about to say, um, cause I hadn't seen it in years. So I watched it in prep for our conversation a few nights ago. And I was just about to say, you know, it's really interesting that they really kept it clean and there's no drug use. And then there was one scene in the dressing room where one woman, uh, passed something to the other girl and they did a little snort, but that was it. That, and we do know that something was cut out of the movie that we saw, the version we saw, because when it was over, she said, hey, what about the Stonehenge thing? I'm like, oh, yeah. So we looked it up on YouTube and watched that. So I, I don't remember if there's other drug use in there that was maybe cut out. Also, like maybe we saw a made for TV version on Pluto. But I, I, my remembrance is that they didn't go into that, which I think was smart, because I would think People like my age, I was 20, whatever at the time, would want their kids to watch it. Here's what daddy does or your uncle. or So I'm glad they kept it as clean as it appeared to be. I thought that was interesting. But all those mishaps, all those manager things, all those relationship things, the, the instruments and the, the things that happen on stage, <laughs> all those things are, they're real. They really are real. They're, I don't think there's any made up stuff from scratch there. They're either replications of something they heard that happened to someone else or exactly taken from something they saw happen. They're cliche for a reason. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of another film we covered uh, inside Lou and Davis, where it's about that sixties uh, folk scene. And it's like, it doesn't matter if he wasn't a real person. I feel like this is like a really good movie about a like, representation that folk. Yeah. Yeah, of that era and that culture. And that's, I guess what we could call spinal tap, right? Yeah. And the amp's going up to 11. You know, that whole conversation with Robin, he says, well, why don't you just make 10 louder? 
<laughs> and he's like, you can just see in his head, like that doesn't even make any sense. So we but made these go to eleven. Right. Like it's so obvious to his. Right, exactly. You know, maybe the new one right. goes up to fourteen. I don't know because technology has advanced. <laughs> oh, good gag. Well, Slide that over to Rob Reiner when you talk to him. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I hope we can make that happen. We've made some pretty neat stuff happen, so I'm kind of counting on it. Yeah, I, I hope Nigel has even more guitars that have the tags on them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's funny because it's clear that uh, Lemmy Kilmeister from Motorhead, the late, great Lemmy, was modeled almost exactly to a degree in that movie. I mean, he got the same mustache, yeah. wore the base the same way. You mm -hmm. know, they did a really good job. Harry Shear was just great. He's brilliant in it. I feel like Harry Shearer yeah. gets lost sometimes in the conversation because Christopher Guest and Michael McKean are so brilliant in their in their own right. And um, but yeah. really, like he is probably my favorite. The like, cucumber at the that. airport scene is just the most classic <laughs> bit. <laughs> I think of it and I laugh. It's the best. Yeah, I think he did a great job. Um, the the clothing. The great job they did with all the clothing. You know, you mentioned the tights, the costumes and stuff. He had the makeup, you know, I, it was great. It was great. It's the best band to not actually exist. And I think you have to give a lot of credit to the musicianship that yeah. they were able to pull something off that is so period accurate and so recognizable, even though it doesn't truly exist in the world. Like, it's actually pretty amazing what they were able to do as a collective. Yeah, they imagined it into reality. The fact that those guys actually wrote the songs and actually performed them is mind blowing. Like, of course, in, in most, if not all cases, they're miming on camera to the recordings, but they did those recordings. That really blew me away when I found that out, you know, years ago. And then to watch that now with, with fresh eyes and ears that might be the most impressive thing about the movie that who would know that the guy that does all those voices for Homer Simpson and, you know, Lenny from Laverne and Shirley, that those guys could rock like that. I think it's great. Yeah. And, you know, I think I watched it when I was a lot younger, so I didn't maybe appreciate like all the different styles that they perform in as well. Like when they're, you know, their pre-spinal tap bands and right. how they're able to ape those um, different sort of um, genre sounds as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's such a great point. Yeah, Ryan, that makes me recall when they showed those really old, like, black and white scenes and the different hairdos, and they made the yeah. film look old. That was masterful how Rob recreated those eras of yes. bands like that. It just slotted them right into history. Yes, yeah, so they're so funny, those little sort of like fake cutaways to like their performances on like the faux Ed Sullivan or whatever, that listen to the right. people song, that give me some money song that kind of tracks like an early who. It's just all so fabulous and so um, believable and but hilarious at the same time. Yeah, I, I know that there's a lot of young musicians four to 14, maybe the 14 year olds are already jamming with other musicians. I think that's when I started playing with other musicians, not counting orchestra at school and you know that kind of thing. If any of you youngsters out there, and parents plug your ears, but if any of you youngsters out there are thinking of being in a band, you really should watch this movie as sort of a orientation to what could happen. Because all that stuff, like we said, all that stuff was real to some degree. And um, there will be relationship issues. Like I, I used to, when people say, so what's your musical history? Okay, so I ended up getting in a band at 15. And I was in bands till probably late 20s. And I got tired of, <laughs> got tired of playing and putting up with three or four other F words and their drama. And I'm sure they were tired of mine. So I got into producing and writing and bringing up other young musicians and doing music for commercials and just kind of got away from that, you know, s slid out of that frame, if you will. But during the time, there's there's moments like when I see what's going on with Journey, uh, the whole mm. that whole thing. And when I hear about uh, 
the members of the who having to fly on separate jets <laughs> but but you see those bands on stage and you'd never know and i kind of went through that to some degree because i was in a band where there was a, a member and i ended up having a halfway falling out while we were in the band and we just <laughs> we couldn't stand each other to a degree but when we played it was like nothing could go wrong everything was great and i remember what kind of made us come around and and sew things up we were playing at the troubadour and if if no one's played at the troubadour that's listening the dressing room's upstairs which is weird <laughs> behind so there's a stage the crowd and the dressing room's upstairs behind the crowd at least when i played in the stone age uh, Fred Flintstone opened for us. That's how long ago. <laughs> but someone, someone took a picture. A tall, a Paul was taller than me. I'm short. I'm like five seven and a half on a really great day. Used to be five eight before all the kids and everything. But <laughs> I fell asleep leaning on him, and he was leaning into the corner. And someone took a picture of us, and we saw that picture, and it was kind of like. Oh, all right, you know, hugged it up. And that was sort of the end of our, our riff. But my point is, there's more than just music to being in a band. There's more than just the musical chemistry. There's more than just the relational parts. You can have a great relationship with someone. Or earlier today, two hours ago, before we got on, I interviewed uh, Annie Escalise, who is the drummer for John Anderson and the Band Geeks. And he's known Richie Castellano, the bass player, since they were like 15. And we talked about that, that just because you're real close with someone and you both play instruments, you might even both be really good, doesn't mean it's going to gel. Conversely, just because you get two or four or five really good musicians together, doesn't mean the human chemistry is going to be there. That's one of the things I feel they really went out of their way to depict in mm -hmm. the movie. They really exemplified that it's it's not all even when you're successful, you know, a lot of rainbows and roses. It's it's just not. So that that's a big takeaway for people who are new to being in a band or want to aspire to being in a band. I'm not saying don't be in a band, but expect the reality of those things. It's not always going to be great. You might and probably will get screwed over by a manager or three. You know, and you, you really got to take the responsibility of not just being airy fairy, artsy fartsy, but learn about the business, know what to watch out for. Surround yourself with people who support you. Otherwise, it's just self sabotage. And part of that is learning from others, find a mentor who's gone farther than you, so that you know what to watch for, look for, listen for, and not have that happen in the music industry. Is a completely different world. We interviewed uh, Derek Shulman of General Giant, who went on to be one of the biggest record executives ever. And I asked him, I said, is there such thing as a record deal anymore? And he said, no, there just isn't. You know, back in the day, they had dump trucks of money, you know, coins, gold coins that were not filled with chocolate like Hanukkah gelt. It was like <laughs> real gold coins. And everyone had their own jet and it's just not like that. The only way, even David Gilmore said this recently in an interview, the only way musicians can make money these days is by getting out and playing, but they have to be able to afford to do that. So how do they afford to do that? Do they have sponsors? Do they have someone fronting them the money? Do they have really good flexible day jobs that allows them the time off? Are they entrepreneurs and have their own business and they can do that? Is there a, a significant other, um, a high, net you know breadwinner it's not easy it's nothing like it used to be and young musicians and artists aspiring to make it big really need to understand that and know how how does it work now you know yeah i mean i think back in the day there weren't things like 360 deals and oh good point yeah yeah and, and when i hear stories oh this breaks my heart things like so Pink Floyd just sold their catalog. I'll get back to that, okay? But like when I heard that the late Peter Grant, the manager for Led Zeppelin, he was getting older. I think maybe he wasn't that that healthy. So he sold 
his publishing rights to the Led Zeppelin catalog. He was cut in as a fifth member. I don't remember what it sold for, but it was a lot. Right after he sold that catalog, the advent of the CD came out. So the entire catalog was reissued as CDs now, whole new revenue stream. And then we've seen as time has gone on, then remasters, collections, hidden finds, buried bones, all those things. So it breaks my heart that who would foresee stuff like that? But maybe now, after decades of new mediums of music and new ways of distribution, we can kind of anticipate you know, how to gauge things. We're not fortune tellers, there's no crystal ball, but at least not to be so hasty about, okay, I made my fortune, I'm selling it all. Now, when it comes to Pink Floyd, a lot of them are calling them sellouts, and I absolutely disagree. Gilmore outlined it perfectly by saying, you know, him and Roger Waters, they have no relationship anymore. And managing both publishing companies of the Pink Floyd catalog became so painful for David Gilmore that now he feels the biggest liberation and relief in life that he doesn't have that headache and they they sold it for 400 million dollars my view is congratulations you've earned it they have the album that no one will i know you never say no one or ever no one will ever have an album on the charts for over 700 consecutive weeks like dark side of the moon no one will ever do that and again i think spinal tap really touched on the arc of success that a, a band mm -hmm. can have. I'm really curious to see what's going to happen with this remake. They're going to be a bunch of old farts, even older than right. me, that had success. Right. Maybe like the Led Zeppelin O2 thing, they come back out of nowhere and do one big show. Right. They had over a million people that were in a lottery for tickets for that. Right. Said, we are not doing a tour. This is it. And I give them credit for that too. Right. Yeah. So is Spinal Tap 2 going to be that, you know, Oasis reunion tour moment for them? Are they going to get rediscovered by a new generation? Like, what is the what is the driving force going to be of that film? Yeah. I'm really curious to see, because when we do meet Spinal Tap in the original film, they're kind of like a band on decline, right? There are a lot of these like seedy and unglamorous situations that they are suddenly finding themselves in after this kind of round of excess and living the high life and having a certain expectation of what rock star life is. And now, you know, they're, they're sort of in free fall and their yeah. two, you know, main creative forces are in that Lennon McCartney way, like being split apart. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting that they're going to make a sequel to this because how, like what is happening? <laughs> yeah. What's good. What, like you said, what is the drama that's going to be the driving force? You know, it's curious for sure. And clearly technology is going to play yeah. some sort of factor in the yeah. film as far as bringing chaos into their lives. But if Christopher Guest is involved in any way, I trust it because he is an absolute genius. Yeah. I wonder if they'll be like, that's such a great point, Ryan, or if they'll be totally lost in the recording studio and not know, like, how does this work? Where's the tape <laughs> machine? Where does the music go to? I remember my first recording where part of it was analog for like the drums, vocals, acoustic instruments. And part of it was my first exposure to the digital part for the guitars, for the keyboards and whatnot. And that was in 1998. And I was like, so where's the other music going? Cause you couldn't see it. You could see the tangible two inch tape on a wash machine size Atari 24 track key, you know, uh, uh, recorder, but where's this other music going? And what the fuck is the cloud? You know, right. When that came along. So I think that's going to be part of it. I agree, Nicole. I think that's going to be a big part of it for both of you. That's like spot on. Yeah. If they skip over that, that's a big miss, right? Oh, I mean, I'm sure they're going to be told they have to, you know, do something for the Instagram or like TikTok or something. And <laughs> So maybe for technology, the amps will now go up to 32. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think my, what might happen is they might show Nigel like these, you know, new micro head amps, you know, that you just oh, and, and wow. it's going to and he's going to be like, what what is this? It looks like a toy. Or God forbid they do what Rush did for years and years. And that was they had no onstage amplification whatsoever. It was all in ear. And on each side of the stage, they had um, 
I forgot what they were called, uh, but they were basically huge sub bass to just sort of vibrate the stage and so they can feel the music. They had no on stage. And that's when they started bringing on the big chicken rotisserie uh, machines or the watch the dryers and had props because they got rid of all on stage uh, speaker and amplification systems. So maybe they will go that route or have the little, like you're saying, the little JVC Bluetooth thing or something. And, I mean, imagine enough to your points them spinal tap guys alone remember he had the archaic cordless thing yeah that might have been before there really was cordless maybe they pulled a star trek number and came out with the communicator before <laughs> the mobile phone and who knows i i don't remember the timeline of of cordless now that i think of that but but there's they have so many different spokes to to go off of that hub of the new new uh reprise of the movie that that it's exciting to see what's going to happen yeah, and earlier when you were telling that story about the Troubadour dressing room, it reminded me of that whole uh, debacle in Cleveland for Spinal Tap where they couldn't find the stage. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> They're in the catacombs. The, yeah, these catacombs. So great. I, I heard it one time or read whose story that was taken for from, and I think it was Aerosmith. I think it might have been Aerosmith got lost finding the stage door. Yeah. And the gentleman who played the janitor guy that was fixing something, he's like, I can't think of his name right now. He was like a real famous blues singer. So they, oh, the cameos, right? Ed Bagley Jr. on one of the yep. black and whites is the drummer. Mm -hmm. uh, the guy who played um, the, the doorman on the Jeffersons, who was the hotel clerk. Do you know who I mean? What I know who you mean. Bradley. Yeah, I can't think of his name Bentley right now, but I know the exactly who you mean. Yeah. They had some great cameos. I mean, figure Rob Reiner just pulled in all his friends, right? Right. Like two of the mime waiters at that party in the beginning of the movie are Dana Carvey oh, yeah. and, and Billy Crystal. Yeah, that was hilarious. That was great. Fun. I wonder, fun. I wonder where they got that idea. Like, we should have a party with mime waiters. I wonder. So it has to be based I, off something. Has I to know be. that Queen had very, very luxurious parties where... Freddie said um, he wanted circus animals. He wanted, and I'm going to go old school, okay, folks? Don't be offended by this. I'm just <laughs> quoting someone. I'm, I'm in my 60s, so I could say this. Like, my, okay, so I'm going to give an example before I say what Freddie did. But like, my wife is black, okay? We use the term black. She's black. We're black. I'm not black. She's black. But <laughs> Freddie said he wanted midgets running around serving the hors d'oeuvres and like circus outfit. They did laugh. I think that's where they got the mime idea from a queen thing. So I didn't want someone getting all upset that I said midgets instead of little people. I'm just. <laughs> that's I'm a direct quote. With, yeah. Direct quote. Direct yes. Quote. Thank you. Yeah. Direct quote. No, we understand. I, I think that's where the mimes came from. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. I think yeah, mimes I mean, are hilarious, by the way. <laughs> it's, it's hilarious. All of it does feel so drawn from real life situations. So I think as you're pointing out, right, a lot of these really got you and a place where you're like, yeah, I can relate to being in a shitty dressing room. I don't know if you've ever been served deli meat that was bigger than the bread. But <laughs> that was that was hilarious. Yeah, I forgot about that. That was and the manager's trying to explain it to him. Well, the frustrated folding of like the tiny little toast bread. <laughs> the, 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 just, it tells bread. me. Yeah, that was great. I could think of two spinal tap moments I went through one in the band before opus one and one in opus one the one in opus one was we played at a college in la and somehow magically my floor tom and my ride cymbal and something else real important didn't get packed with all the stuff and i lost my mind and there was no time to go back and get it and we were a prog rock band, like I said. So it's it's like, in my mind, every little piece mattered because yeah. it's like, you know, when people say, oh, what do you play a big drum kit for? What are you, an octopus? No, it's like a piano. Just because it has 88 keys doesn't mean you're all over the place, right? So that was one. Um, and then uh, when I was in the band before that, we were playing a big outdoor party that was kind of in a residential area, but kind of not, but I guess enough to where someone complained about the the loudness and we were playing Achilles last stand by Led Zeppelin and all of a sudden this searchlight turns on from a helicopter 
and it's going in circles. And there was this giant oak tree. So as the helicopter circling, the shadows were creating this crazy shadow that kept spinning on the ground. And we were getting inertia from it, like almost to the point where we got sick. And then 20 cops jump over a wall, oh. break up the party. And, and we're like, you know, they were cool with us. He said, you know, we can throw all this crap in a big truck and this and that, but you guys are being compliant, so we're not. And while I'm talking to one of the cops, someone throws a bottle and it goes like right between us. And that oh, was yeah. just the craziest moment I ever remember from being in a band of something that kind of went sideways. So, so having relationship things happen, having equipment things happen, having that thing happen tells me and some other stories I've read, everything from Spinal Tap is, is real totally real like getting trapped trapped in your like little egg thing <laughs> for the oh, whole song. Right. oh there is, you know what i wonder if that came from the story um, of that is a good one rick wakeman tells the story in the oh he's got a dvd called um this is from the early to mid 2000s i can't think of the tv the dvd but he plays piano plays a song then he tells a story, plays a song. So he tells a story of King Arthur. He's on tour playing King Arthur. And at this big, like 17th century church, they had a giant church organ. He asked if he could use it. They said, yeah, but there was this thing where they had a trap door in the stage and he was going to rise up with his keyboard rig. And this, the trap door didn't open and it kept getting banged against it. And the... They were all drunk the night before, and Rick would go to so-and-so's room. So what's the first song? It, it's this song. Okay, great. What's the first song? This one had a different title. They all started the concert playing a different song. <laughs> Plus, the door didn't open. And when it finally came up, he was all, like, cut up and bloodied and crawling onto the stage. I wonder if that's where they got that couldn't get out of the egg thing. I don't know. That just occurred to me when you brought that up. And the guy prying it open, he's got a torch. He's got <laughs> yeah. The other thing, that was a great scene. We were and the scene goes on so long. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It only like like gag. Half the song or something. Yeah, and then he finally great. gets out and, and like the song is over. Triumphant, <laughs> yeah. You know, and the song's over. Yeah, yeah, great. The the song, and then he has yeah. to go back right in. <laughs> <laughs> great movie. Great movie. So since you were in a prog rock band, I assume that you found a lot of um, enjoyment in their song Stonehenge. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The big epic, right? Yeah, the big epic, real <laughs> dramatic. And the prop was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, big epic, little hinge. Yeah, yeah. I, and I don't know. Tiny hinge. Yeah, I don't know if this was planned, but it looked like a, a Jewish high, which is <laughs> for for basically live long and prosper. Sure. That's what that one piece from the stone hinge, the hinge <laughs> looked like. I don't know if that was planned or not. That that was hilarious, but the song was really good. And again, I have to say how impressed I am that they actually wrote these songs. Rob Reiner contributed, he gets a, a writing credit and I think a production credit and they actually played those songs. Yeah, and you can tell there's a real love and understanding of what they're writing. You know, yeah, they're, they're obviously like sending it up, but like to get to that point, like you have to like understand the music. Yeah, absolutely. And the era. Yeah, you, you have to understand the genres, the era, like there's such a deep understanding of all of that. Then also just sort of song craft in general. Uh, there's a great article where Michael McKean kind of breaks down how they came up with a lot of these songs. Uh, and he talks about how Hellhole was originally called Time Code, but essentially it ended up sounding too smart. And so they went with Hellhole because they felt like that would make, you know, a great opening hook for the film and just sort of yeah, this yeah. like, you know, big over the top like rock moment. But they knew and had the instincts to know that like, we can't make this too smart. We can't, it can't be too good. It should be kind of also bad. Right. And they, with the music, as you point out, Nicole, their personal investment in it, they had that same investment, like you mentioned earlier, with the fashion. You know, they really covered the fashion. And then the whole, you know, that starts to decline when they were in that one hotel lobby and said the show got in Baltimore got canceled. And you can kind of see their bubble bursting on their faces. And, you know, I think one or two of them sort of being a little dismissive about it and 
all of that. Um, there's an arc, you know, how wide will the top of that arc last? How wide and long is that? We, we don't know till we've reached right. uh, the farther end of the downslope of that arc, I guess. Yeah. I think it shows also kind of a, a, there's a lack of ego in the comedy here and in the way that it was created, where the temptation would probably be to make like a great song. So I think they're all very capable of that as a group. But yeah. instead, you know, they they made Big Bottom happen. And then like <laughs> literally said to themselves, like, yeah, this is inspired by Queen, but we're not Queen and that's fine. It's, it's, a, it's a great song. Every time I think about the lyrics to Big Bottom, I laugh. Yeah, yeah, yeah I remember from Big Bottom, yeah. Well, you know, Rob Reiner, as as Marty DeBerge, uh refers to them as the loudest band to ever come out of England. He doesn't say anything about them being any good. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> that is such a good catch, right? Because it's like they're not, they've kind of recognized that they're not really that good. They're just loud and just entertaining loud. and schlocky. And that's what's lovable <laughs> about it in the end. Yeah, and I think the, the manager also says at one point when... Uh, Marty asks about, you know, they're playing smaller crowds on this tour. And he goes, the band has just gotten more selective. <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, um, the safety net line. Safety net. Something else I love about, about Big Bottom is just like the, how hard they go with the bass. And I guess like at some point they played it at Wembley Stadium when they reformed in like 09 or something to do like a, a little right. leg of like a reunion tour. And they're like, yeah, we got 19 bass players on stage. <laughs> <laughs> big yeah. bottom which is incredible that's hilarious yeah what a bit have you ever seen like a really really well-known huge act play in a small place like house of blues or a small theater type of place do you mind if i ask who i think so the closest that i can come to this but i don't know that it really counts because it's not like a, it's just a two-piece as i saw the white stripes the glass house oh. in Mona, and i don't know if that's what was the seating in there? Do you remember? Well, it's so standing, but it's small. I don't know. What do you think the glass house holds, Ryan? You've been there. I'm gonna say 500. Pretty small. Oh, wow, I yeah. would say that's a small venue for like a club. Yeah, and we all know that a lot of the huge bands start like Led Zeppelin start at the Whiskey in LA. Sure. And and so on and so on. But I I saw John Paul Jones at mm -hmm. the at, at the uh, Hollywood House of Blues. And that was amazing to be that close to the guy from Led Zeppelin. That was just amazing. But I also saw Yes at the same theater. And I saw Yes at a same size theater in San Diego two nights before, two nights after. And this would have been in the year 2000. This was the, um, the latter tour. And the year before, the tour before that in 98 or 99, I saw the Open Your Eyes tour at a small theater in... Uh, in San Diego. And that was the first time I saw an enormous LA Forum, Madison Square Garden type band play in a small play, place like that. And I got to admit, it was a little confusing because it's like, what, aren't people still into yes? Or, you know, it's a little weird, but um, I kind of do get it now because they were just being more selective, right? <laughs> <laughs> Well, sometimes bands like to do that. They do, you know, kind of that back to basic sort of thing. We got to reconnect. Yeah. And now I don't mind because like when my son and I, Steve saw, uh, he came out to Phoenix. Uh, well, up to where I live, 100 miles from Phoenix in the mountains for a week. And we went down to Phoenix and saw John Anderson and the band geeks at a relatively small place called the, the Celebrity Theater. And I think it seats like 3,700 or something like that. And we were like in the 12th row and it was felt real intimate and there was nothing weird about it. After all these years of seeing bands, big names, play, I saw Ted Nugent play in the same place. Um, I saw, but yet I saw Styx still play at this, Styx? Yeah, I saw Styx and Journey play at a huge outdoor place in Phoenix. So there's still a little bit of both going on and now I don't even, I don't judge or get confused, you know, I just, and I, and I am selective about who I go see only because I do live where it's not so convenient. It's like a whole day we spend the night, got to board right. the dogs or get our housekeeper, right. house sitter, you know, it's just not as easy anymore. Um, and sure. that's our fault for, for moving away. We just decided to get out of big city life. My wife's from the Bronx. I'm from LA. We met when we lived in Las Vegas for years and 
we decided to just get out of the city. May have overcorrected a little bit. There's 7,200 <laughs> people where we live. Yeah, you don't give someone the finger when you're driving in this town. You'll see them at the market in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but then again, you probably know who they are, so it's okay. <laughs> when I think of uh, when this film was made, which was 80, was it 82? 84 is when it came out. Well, that's when it came out, came out yeah. The year the, of the LA Olympics, yeah. Because I remember, because I was in that band, Opus One at the time, and we played an Olympics thing in LA at the time. Cool. They really did a great job of matching what was the in production of the bands that were kind of emerging and kind of hot at the time, mm -hmm. like not just the bigger bands like Aerosmith and stuff, but when I think about the bands that were playing, the clubs that we were playing, Motley Crue, Great White, mm -hmm. um, Accept, you know, all those types of bands, Rat they kind of matched that whole thing and they had the spandex and they just, it, this is spinal tap and they should have added now because it replicated that year and that era. And then again, those jump backs to them back in time in the black and white were just perfect. They were perfect. We are, and the hair alone, I feel like the, the whatever wig stylist on that film like deserves yeah. some kind of special Oscar because the, yeah. the hairstyles <laughs> in that film are, are really incredible. There's, there's a cool piece of lore where apparently somebody slipped Jamie Lee Curtis, who is Christopher Guest's longtime wife, a, a picture of him as Nigel Tufnell in the movie. And she was so intrigued that she's like, yeah, get me his number. Oh, wow. That's how that happened? <laughs> Allegedly, that's how that happened. Interesting. So powerful styling. Well, I have a picture here. I know your listeners can't see it, but I'll show you because I pulled this off the wall a few shows ago because someone asked me. I said, I said something like, yeah, I'm five, seven and a half. I used to be five, nine with hair. And I, I had the hair, man. I had, where is it? There we go. I had wow. Hair. wow. Oh, we're putting that, we're putting that on the gram. That's excellent. I'll send you this. How, how old do you think I am now? I mean, it's with the whole long hair and the beard effect, it's a little bit hard to tell. But you, what, 25, 26? Ryan? I'm going to go 22. It was my 17th birthday. Oh my wow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I had it going on. The girls at school 17. called it the, the lion's mane. And that, the, how did you have my, enough years that, under your belt? That is strong. Well, it is. Wow. What was that? Say that again. What, I mean, how did you have like enough years under your belt to have to get your hair that long? When, I, when did you start growing it? I started growing when I was 14 or 15. Wow. I, and it was like down to here. And my mom was a, in the day they called, they called them a hairdresser. And it bugged the <laughs> out of her. <laughs> here I am doing men's hair and you're, but she let me do it. You know, I was a musician and I had like Ferret Fossa, Ferret, Ferret Fawcett, Fawcett Ferret, Ferret <laughs> Fawcett would have wanted my hair. I had the feathered hair. I had, it was great. And um, the narcs at school thought I was a drug dealer and then <laughs> drug dealers thought I was a narc. <laughs> I'd have and to what year was ID. this roughly, if you don't mind us asking? No, I don't mind. It was, uh, I'll be 62 in April. So that was 79. I turned. 70, 80, in 1980, I turned 17. So it was April of 1980. And uh, until the narcs did get to know me, I had to show my ID to get back into school if I went home for lunch or out with my buddies. <laughs> <laughs> so wild how much stock people placed in like a long hairstyle back in the day. Like my mom has told me these stories about how like you couldn't get into Disneyland at some point if your right. hair was like past a certain point. Right. Maybe like on you your know, ear, like if you were a guy, which is crazy. I remember that. For those who don't know who are listening, I'm I have a shaved head. I've have the I have the stupid Jewish horseshoe if I let my hair grow out, okay? <laughs> but um but yeah, back in the day I had the hair and it got to a point where in my thirties, early forties, one of my daughters used to braid my hair because I had a convertible, <laughs> I used to drive with the windows down. It just got too crazy. So she'd give me a long braid. And then it just got to a point where it was thinning on top and it was starting to look a little like, come on, what are you doing? And I've never been a, the whole comb over thing, like dudes, if you have a comb over, just shave your head, just shave it. 
And I shaved my head when I was July of 2022, 20, I think. So however old I was, oh, I would have been 39. And I shaved my head and I just, I've never not shaved it since. And it's been great. So anybody that's a little follically challenged out there, even women, just shave your head. <laughs> just go for it. Go for it. I agree with that. Low maintenance, very low maintenance. You know what the maintenance is? Other than a shave, it's just a little bit of lotion. Sometimes powder, if I'm on camera, sometimes that's it. You just might need extra sunblock if it's hot outside. <laughs> <laughs> extra sunblock, yeah, for sure. Got to be careful of that, yeah. <laughs> You know, it's funny that we are talking about this new uh, Spinal Tap project that's coming out and how it can bring Spinal Tap to a new generation of of fans. For me, my first introduction to Spinal Tap was in the very meta appearance on The Simpsons. Oh, yeah. Where Bart is obsessed with going to see them. You know, Harry Shearer is doing even more voices because he has to do Derek Smalls as well. Right. And then there's that uh, brilliant, I, I forget if it's Nigel or David, where they go, oh, thank you. F- thank you for having us. And then he has to look at his guitar and on the back, it's taped Springfield. He goes, <laughs> ah, sp- thank you, that, Springfield. That is from reality. I have literally heard either in person or seen clips of an artist saying the wrong city of where oh, they yeah. are. Thank you, Chicago. And they're in Detroit or something. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. So yeah, how I, old, if you don't mind me asking, how old were you each when you discovered Spinal Tap? You don't have to say when that was. Oh, Nicole. gosh. No, yeah. no, no. It's I, it's okay. Everyone's well aware of our advanced ages if you listen to this show frequently. Oh, okay. uh, we, uh, I think I probably watched it first when I was like in college. So I might have been like, you know, 19 or something. Okay. Yeah. So I, you know, obviously I saw the Simpsons episode when it came out. I believe it was like 92. And then the first time I saw this is Spinal Tap, I believe was uh, was high school, like senior year of high school. I think. Oh, okay. I mean, it's such a cult classic that you know. I and I think it like um, I can't remember in the timeline like when some of the more recent Christopher Guest films came out and when I became obsessed right. with Christopher Guest. But all of those films are incredible, and this is no exception. This is probably one of my most rewatched movies because it's just so fun. You know what I'm surprised about? I'm surprised that um, into the 2000s and beyond up till now, if you look at a whole bunch of animated Star Wars spinoffs and other things like that, that there's not a Spinal Tap cartoon that's on the clean side for kids or even to be shown at 11 at night for adults. You know, that would be easier yeah. production. The guys could still do the voices. I think True. that'd be hilarious. I think people would watch it. Yeah, and we know that Harry could voice like 10 characters if they needed him to. Yeah, to ex- money. exactly. Brought to you by a, uh, a CBD brand or something. <laughs> <laughs> a dispensary chain. <laughs> the most British, terrible tasting CBD brand. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, totally. I also think it's like it's you cannot underestimate or undersell the importance of this film to a lot of films that came after it. I think if this didn't exist is sort of the first mockumentary, if you want to term it that of its kind, you know, we wouldn't have like a walk hard. I don't even think we would have like we wouldn't have pop star. We wouldn't have um, no, I think I'm the obsession sure with biopics thing. that we've had in like the intervening years. Right. I would watch this all day That's long over Bohemian Rhapsody. Just putting that out there. Like, Wow, that's a huge statement. Because <laughs> I think Bohemian Rhapsody was done so well. I think it was done really well. Uh, so where would you compare to, did you see Rocket Man? The, the I did. I did see Rocket Man and I enjoyed Rocket Man and, and I enjoyed elements of Bohemian Rhapsody. But there's something about Spinal Tap that almost feels more honest in a way. I think because, you're right. it, you know, there, there are aspects of it that do oh. not feel editorialized by band members that want to be remembered a certain way. Instead, it's just kind of this unvarnished, right. this is actually what it's like to be in a band. And I think you've sort of pointed that out, right? I, I think that's why people like it, why it still continues to resonate, because it's not glossing anything. It is kind of real. There's no one to protect. 
So yeah, they right. just let right. it all out. There's yeah. no one to protect. That's exactly what it is. It's there's there's yeah. no right. let's keep it gonna, messy. Right. Yeah. We're gonna let's tell all messy. these stories. We're gonna have a full on joke about lip herpes where the herpes <laughs> on their lips like <laughs> migrate around for the entire film, which is a subplot that they cut. I get I didn't realize this until I read it, but they cut a subplot about everybody like sleeping with the same like promiscuous female like band it like opening band singer well i don't know if that ever happens <laughs> right that would never happen i'm sure but that's how they hey, get wait, 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 wait just for the record i gotta say for the record all the years i was in bands i was either with this i was with the first girlfriend for four and a half years she went through a lot with me i was either with a girlfriend or was married and i met my first wife actually when i was in opus one i was never single and in a band and i never did outside something outside my relationship while in a band just so you know just for whoever was listening and kept it on the up and up okay any exes that are listening that's right i my parents set a great example but what you're saying exemplifies what does really happen because i do know about some stuff that went on with certain people and I think most people do, whether you're in a band or in or a fan of a band that you've read a biography about, you know that stuff goes on. Oh, sure. If it can happen to Dave Grohl, it can happen to you. I'm sorry. I, hope it's still <laughs> I said that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know why Dave Grohl's in it all of a sudden, but that news is new. <laughs> I don't know. My my wife's pretty hot. I don't think. Uh, <laughs> I know the viewers can't see that, but there she is. Oh hell yeah! You did good, Dan. Thanks. Good for you. Sex. Don't tell her I said that. <laughs> <laughs> don't listen, Dan's wife. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Don't. Oops. We'll bleep that out. She'll say. Yeah, we'll bleep that. that. <laughs> she'll say, so how'd you go? When can I watch it? Ah, you don't need to watch that one. Yeah. Skip it. Yeah. She knows I tell on her Honey. sometimes because I think it's amazing that people think she's twenty years younger than I am, and she's <laughs> five years older. <laughs> well, we're obviously really bad at guessing ages, so. Yeah. We're like, what are you, 35 in that picture? I would turn 17 that day. Right. Shocking. We're putting up that picture. It's my 17th birthday. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So I have to ask, as somebody who is a drummer. Yeah. So drumming figures very prominently in this picture in a very funny way because all of their drummers die in horrible accidents. And that's part of the Spinal Tap legacy is drummers dying. Which drummer death do you think is the most realistic? Would it be bizarre gardening accident? Would it be spontaneous combustion? Or do you think choking on someone else's vomit? Yeah, yeah not your own vomit. Not yours. Someone else's, someone else's vomit, else's vomit right. is, the, is the key. No, no. I'm going to preface my answer by saying I went home from high school crying when John Bonham died. Yeah. And my mom wrote me a note to go back to school the next day that said Danny left school yesterday because a friend of the family died. Oh, like, wow. That's how into Led Zeppelin and John Bonham I was. So it kind of hurt me that they used that, but it is a funny joke. You have to be a grown up and say, that's funny. In fact, I, I can joke about anything, including death now, but the real most realistic one is a bizarre gardening accident because that's how Jeff Picaro died. Jeff Picaro from Toto, they were going to have a party at the house, like a, a band. It was after a tour or after they finished recording an album or something, they were going to have a party. They were getting the yard ready and he had some allergic reaction to um, an insecticide spray that he was spraying. And that's how he died. That's horrible. Yeah, it happened literally um, a few blocks from where I grew up, and I didn't grow up in a rich area. I met Alan White of Yes because a friend of mine who set up my equipment for 23 years, and we're still close friends somehow, said that, hey, did you know Alan White lives across from Bernie, like two blocks from your parents' house? I'm like, what? Long story short, I drove by his house one time, and he was outside mowing the lawn. I ended up, this is a full story, took him a turkey on Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> and we became friends. I knew Alan f- until his passing. But that, and Alan was a very, I didn't live in a rich area, but Alan, when he moved to America, that's where he first lived. And Jeff died supposedly from 
an allergic reaction to a weed killer or insecticide or something, get in the yard ready for this barbecue. So that's probably a deep cut for most wow. people. Like, like there, when, it is for when, me. Absolutely. When, when people hear bizarre guarding accident, they probably think of foghorn leghorn stepping on a rake and it going boing up in his yeah. nose or something. Yeah, shears. But I'm thinking of like shears. I'm sure that's where they got that from. Wow. See. Yeah. The self-combustion thing must be because we are so hot as drummers that's what, <laughs> that's yeah, what i thought? thought you were gonna say i was like dan is for sure gonna say that that's one sad. right <laughs> right and that happened to most of their drummers i think i think more than one of the past drummers self-combusted right because he showed a couple if i remember right yeah including the last one right right before they went to japan it's a persistent issue with drummers drummers get a bad rap too i think you know drummers are uh, thanks to Keith Moon and John Bonham and Ginger Baker, who I just love all of them. But, uh, you know, the whole throwing the TV out the toilets and, and uh, I mean, throwing the TV out the window and putting dynamites in the toilets and Ginger being such a curmudgeon and all those things. I think that drummers get a bad rap, not being looked at as musicians unless we play other mm -hmm. instruments. Um, but I, I, the analogy I like to use is, a lot of people think hockey players are the real brutes. And in the sporting world, they're some of the most gentlemanly men you could meet. I, someone who worked with me in Drum Talk TV the first few years, Lori, said that the first time she went to a NAMM show with me as our on-site producer, and she started meeting all these big artists and stuff. I'm introduced, and she said, you know, the drummers are like the hockey players of the world. You think they're they're just monsters or cavemen, and they're the most sweetest guys. I said, I know. You're speaking of the choir. I know. <laughs> Vindicated. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's that's. I think there's so many stereotypes, right? And of course, there's truth behind every stereotype, or there wouldn't be that stereotype. Yeah, this feels like a very specific Mythbusters episode. All of a sudden, where I feel like we're yeah, getting yeah. There off. you go. <laughs> Did you think that was true? No. Dan says no. So. Dan says no. I'm there. <laughs> I was gonna say I like the shirt that uh, one of the shirts that you sell through your website, where it says uh, you're not really a fan of a band if you don't know who the drummer is. That's right. That's right. Because a lot of people only know if they're casual music fans they know the lead singer or they know eddie van halen or they know they know elton john but they don't know that nigel olsen was his drummer for like 40 years or something you know things like that so i i believe in that i believe in that credo for sure yeah i mean i i don't think you can see a, i don't think any good live band has like a a mediocre rhythm section right absolutely yeah yeah there's a story behind every every situation, and most of them are 98% true. And Spinal Tap, right? How can we? Maybe Rob set out to do a real documentary, but realized none of these people are going to put themselves on blast. So he collected all these stories, and voila, there we have Spinal Tap. Maybe that's how it all came about. Lennon. Well, also, I think, you know, because of their, because of the fact that so many of these bands of this era were so over the top, like you wouldn't believe that they're like real people. Right. The whole larger than life persona. Yeah. And I've met so many of them that are still alive and you, you wouldn't believe how, well, you two probably would, but you wouldn't believe how down to earth and humble they are. Um, yeah. And I I love that. There's been in 11 years and 10 months tomorrow of Drum Talk TV, there's been maybe two that were like bubble bursters. Mm -hmm. Two. And they didn't come on the show, but there were two that were like, really? Mm -hmm. Everyone else, as big a star as you could think of, have been just the nicest most wonderful, sweetest, down-to-earth people, even with all their fame, all their money, all their gold platinum albums, all their whatever you could imagine fits in that bucket. Just really great people. And I love that. I don't know if you know this, but big artists are people too. That's true. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like drummers have to be pretty nice people because they end up playing with a bunch of, 
you know, they're usually part of like three or four bands because everyone needs a drummer. Right. Yeah. So if you're the if you're the drummer that like can't find a gig, it's probably because you're a jerk. Yeah. It's purely, <laughs> no, it's true. That's such a great point. Like purely anecdotally, but anyone that I've ever known is that has drummed in a band or that is a drummer has always been like super chill. Like really? just like sort of a general like a cooler in most situations. Well, well, so I, I think there's, the, there's there's a biological and I'm gonna say emotional reason for it too, and I I think that being able to sit whether it's hand drums like I have behind me whether it's sitting at a drum set and just blowing out your pipes that's where angst goes that's where i'm speaking mm. from experience okay did i mention we have 11 kids 19 grandkids and three grand? <laughs> okay that's where i can blow my pipes out and just you know, i'm just going to go in my studio and play you know or or my wife anja thank you anja my biggest supporter anja will say if i'm going through some aggravation on the business side or frustrated with stuff, she'll say, why don't you just go in the studio and play? And that's where we can let all that out. A receptionist at a hotel can't always do that if they don't play drums. A waiter, he or she can't always do that. A school teacher, you know, a, a firefighter, God forbid, with all the PST and stuff they must go through and things. I, I think that plays into a lot is that we have maybe with athletes too i don't know but we physically more than any other musician and running around on stage with a tuba doesn't count running around with a guitar doesn't count to play our instrument takes the most physical effort even if you're playing some soft jazz we're using mm -hmm. pretty much all four limbs mm -hmm. i think that's part of it i really do that there's like that antithesis of i get to do this and mm -hmm. it makes me feel like that yeah, it's an outlet and, and a release. Right. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Hopefully I've lived up to it. I don't know. Do not ask my wife. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. No, we won't have any follow-ups. <laughs> okay. I'm just glad you didn't ask for references. Yeah, we won't pull the class. Okay. <laughs> Fun stuff. What a great topic, Spinal Tap, right? So, Nicole, I'm going to put you on the spot. Who is your favorite um, drummer? Oh, God, I don't know. Other than me. Oh, yeah, geez. other than Dan. Why would you do this to me? I don't know. And if you don't to know answer the this drummer's question. name, <laughs> if you don't know the drummer's name, you can say the band, and, and I'll Not tell you the truth. Not prepared to answer this question. Not prepared to answer this question, Ryan. I don't know. No? Okay. I'm sorry. We'll cut this one. We'll cut it. <laughs> I'm not prepared That's to answer this question. I'm bad under pressure. She doesn't like want to offend all uh, the other drummers, of course, that know she Yeah, loses. exactly. And I, I can't say Dave Grohl because I already said something mean about him on this podcast. <laughs> How about yours, Ryan? Uh, probably Glenn Koch from Wilco. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm a big fan of his. That's a good one. That's a good one because he's not super popular. You know. Yeah, he's not super popular, and he kind of has like a more like experimental jazz percussion style. Yeah, yeah. Ah, see, now I got to tell Steve to get him on. Oh, he's, not had Glenn he's on great. Before. He's great. Yeah, we've not had Glenn on. Yeah. Oh yeah, and then and Elton's a percussionist. He is amazing. Oh, Ray Cooper. Yeah, Ray Cooper's amazing. Who has played with just about everybody as a percussionist. Yeah, Ray, Ray's also got a great sense of humor. He's super funny, too. I've heard uh, an interview with him about the importance of bringing humor into music, which I am a huge fan of. Rick Wakeman, huge comedy act. Uh, the late, great Chris Squire of Yes, huge funny guy. You know, it goes on and on. There's, there's a lot of humor. I think that's something that's also kind of um, goes a lot with most musicians. Definitely drummers have a good sense of humor. Yeah, John Worcester is hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> so, Nicole, who's your third favorite drummer? Well, I was going to say, I, I, I was going to say, I, I, I was really into Jim White when I saw him play with Bill Callahan on his last short tour. He's kind of a, a jazz yeah. ensemble, and he's he does a lot of stuff with the Drag City label. He's a great percussionist. Love him. Um, I don't, yeah, of yeah. course, you know who that is. I don't know if other people know who that is. But. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good call. Uh, there's so many too. That's the thing. That's the thing. It's like it's too. I don't know. Like there are so many amazing drummers. So yeah, I think it. 
it also depends How do you on the choose? mood, the genre of music. Right. You know, you could break it down to so many different classifications, you know. Right. But favorite, I like to say, is always different than best. You oh, know? yeah. But it's... Because I think you can't say best. People you can't say saying, best. Yeah. It's, so, it's subjective. Yeah. You know, it's what you like. I might have it's favorites thing and do. things that speak to me, but it doesn't mean they're the best. Right. Exactly. I am so on board with that. I hate when people ask online. So what's the best drum head for this? What's the best drum for this? What's the, who's the best drummer who there is no best. It's what suits your sensibilities, whether it's a sound for gear or whether it's the music, you know, there is no best. Yeah. What feels good for you? Right. Exactly. That's what matters. Yeah. My friend asked me the same thing. Like, what should I, what guitar should I buy? I was like, whatever sounds good to you when you play it on at the store. Yeah. Exactly. Do you play guitar, Ryan? I do. Ah, what's your favorite kind of music? Um, you know, I would say like alt indie rock, but I also listen to a lot of hip hop. Huh. But, you know, that's why I know about these like little micro amp things that would probably yeah. confuse Nigel at this point. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. It's fun stuff. Do you play anything? Nicole? Oh, I wish I did, but no, I, you know, I went from playing the recorder really poorly in elementary school to like having dalliances with acoustic guitar like everybody does. And that's about it. I never got past those few chords. <laughs> Do you still play it at all? I still have my guitar and sometimes I will strum it, but I am not good. And I should go back to taking lessons if I want to be good at something. So you won't play it at people when they come no, over? No, I won't house. play it at people. No, you're not going to get, I, you know, push by Matchbox 20 if you come to my house. You know what, though? You don't have to be good to enjoy it. And it's the fun that should come first. It, re it really, really is. Sometimes I don't play for, some people think this is crazy because I'm the Jump Talk TV guy. But sometimes <laughs> I don't play for like two, three weeks at a time. And I might be a little rusty, but I have so much fun. I have more fun playing now than I did when I was touring, when I was recording, when I was playing all up and down the Sunset Strip. I have more fun playing now because even though I am the Drum Talk TV guy and people want to know, well, can he play? Because there's certain people at other media companies in our space that don't really, or they won't play on camera. Yeah. And I respect that. But I, I just put myself out there. I'm not chasing rainbows or a record deal. I put myself out there and I played a Yes, Genesis, ELP, Zeppelin, Deep Purple, Steely Dan, Jethro Tull. Uh, I love simple, fun stuff like the B-52s and all kinds of stuff. And I don't rehearse a thing. I just, I just play because it's so much fun. Yeah. And if you look at it that way, you don't have to learn more than three chords. Just it's a different form of expression. When we talked about earlier about that release of angst or something, just burn some sage, light a candle, sit down with the guitar, close your eyes and just strum some chords. And if that's what works for you, you're an expert at it. That's the way I look at music and playing an instrument. You know? I think that's beautiful. There's a, there's a really great quote from the movie Harold and Maude about everybody should be able to play a little bit of music because it's the cosmic dance. And I love that. I love that sentiment of you should really just do it because it feels so good. And it's part of being alive and being human. I think that's what we love about this show is that we get to connect with people who feel that as well. So, yeah, there's a natural innate connection between music and the human vibration and especially drums and rhythm and, and all of that. We, we have something beating in us, you know, right there. That's rhythm. Um, Maybe that's why I'm so good at like syncopation and off times because I have arrhythmia. I never thought of that. But Ooh. anyway, <laughs> I think that, you know, people who say, um, oh, I don't have rhythm. It's like my wife is an artist and does therapy. And when people say she wants them to get creative in the therapeutic process, she says, oh, I don't have any artistic ability. She says, you have it. You haven't found it or woken it up yet. And I feel the same thing with music. It's not about measuring. Can you get in front of people on a stage? Can you sit in? Can you do an open mic? It's not about that. It's about can you get to a point where with three chords, you can sit and play something, maybe experiment with different rhythms or just do drone over and over. Bring, bring, bring with maybe some 
777 hertz meditation music on with it and a candle and just just be and enjoy it that's a group i think that's a great uh kind of statement to end on um so thank you dan for coming on the podcast yeah thank Thank you dan Dan. this was so much fun yeah we had a great time chatting with you we loved connecting all these hilarious plot points of spinal tap to to real rock stories and just to hear about uh to hear about drum talk tv and to hear about your own uh your own past thank you i am honored that you have me i mckenna sent me your channel and everything i listened to a few episodes and i was like wow i get to be on that you guys do a really really good job and i'm i'm real critical too <laughs> <laughs> well thank you that means a lot yeah. then yeah it's a fun dynamic and it works really really well it's great well, thank you And uh, remember to check out Drum Talk TV. Um, We will have the link to the membership program with three free months if you'd like to check it out. Yeah, thank you. What social channels uh, can people find you on? So we have all of our content except what's in the membership site. There's some stuff in the membership site that was distributed differently than everywhere else. But on Facebook, we have everything. Actually, Facebook and Instagram, we have everything. We have over a million followers on Facebook alone, but we're also on YouTube. Anything we've ever done that's video is on YouTube, as well as Vimeo, and whatever will physically fit into Twitter slash X. We're firing up TikTok channels right now as well. Um, Those will be out maybe by the time this is out. DrumTalkTV.com is the main mothership site drumtalktvbrilliance.com is the membership site and whatever platform people like to follow the most they can find us there and it's all at drum talk tv perfect we will put those in our show notes so check those out and um thank you again dan we had a blast talking to you thank you but not like in a spontaneous combustion blast (laughs) yeah right i've always been worried about that i get a little worked up sometimes (laughs) my wife says (laughs) thank you yeah thank you so much and have a good rest of your day yeah thank you dan nice to meet you